Hello everyone, welcome to ML with AP. The topic for today is logistic regression. It's intuition, the maths behind, and we'll try to code it from scratch. Let's learn. We'll try to learn logistic regression using these five activities. The first, we'll try to understand the intuition behind logistic regression. After that, we'll try to understand and answer a very important question. Why it is called regression when obviously it is a classification algorithm. After that, we'll go down and see the maths behind logistic regression. Don't worry, as long as you know the basics of partial derivative, you should be able to understand. We'll explain everything clearly. After that, we'll try to code it from scratch. We'll, we are not going to use the standard package like sklearn. We are going to code it using NumPy and Pandas basic libraries. And at the very end, we'll try to understand why logistic regression is considered as a simple neural network. It is a base, it's very simple to a simple perceptron and we'll try to understand that concept as well. So without further ado, let's jump right in. To understand logistic regression, let's try to recall what our linear regression was and we'll try to understand that with a very simple data set. So we have a simple data set of number of hours study and we'll try to predict the marks obtained by a set of students in a given exam. When we plot this scatter plot, on the x-axis, we have our observations, the number of our study, and the marks obtained. What we try to do in a linear regression? We try to do a best fit line. What is the best fit line? Where our mean square error is the lowest. By that, we, we simply mean that the difference between the observed and the predicted value the square of that should be minimum okay this is what linear regression is now let's let's tweak this problem a little bit in this particular scenario our predicted variable marks was a continuous variable right so these are numerical continuous what if we have our data set something like this where we have number of our study but our predicted variable is pass or fail, it is categorical, it is binary, either it is 0 for fail or 1 for pass. Let's try to see if the linear regression will do the trick over here, will solve our problem over here. Once we try to plot it on a scatter plot, it will look like this. The data where it is fail will all come on the 0, so either it is 0 or 1. So all the data will lie either on the zero y on, on the y-axis, either on the zero or in the first position, one position, right? Now, if you can see over here, if we try to do a best fit line, probably we can draw a line over here, okay? And then if we have to do the prediction, what we can do, we can say that, okay, anywhere where I see the prediction of the value going higher than 0.5, over here, which is denoted by this green dotted line. Anything which is on the right side of this, right side over here, we'll consider that as a pass. Anything less than 0.5, we'll consider that as fail. In this particular situation, it worked beautifully because it is the data is completely linearly separable and you can see that all the predictions are correct. Everything on the right of this blue dotted line are pass, everything on the left of this blue dotted line are fail. So my, my this best fit line is doing its job, okay? Now let's tweak this problem a little bit, okay? And see that what problem could happen if we try to use linear regression for a categorical use case or categorical predictions. Let's see we have a data set like 60. Somebody has studied 60 hours of a study and he was also passed. If we try to predict, we'll have a data point on the far right over here, 60. If we try to do a best fit line, the best fit line could be like this, okay, because of this particular data point. Now let's try to do the same thing what we did in the last slide. We'll try to see that, okay, anything above 0.5, we'll try to predict it as pass. Anything below 0.5, we'll try to predict it fail. Again, my blue dotted line has come up. Anything on the left, because it's less than 0.5, I'll try to predict as fail. Now, can you see over here that there are a lot of misclassifications? All these are actually pass, but my algorithm 
if I'm using a linear regression for a categorical data set or to predict binary classification, it is doing a lot of misclassifications over here. All these are fast, but it is being misclassified as fail over here. So this is the first problem with linear regression. And that's why we can't use linear regression in these use cases. What is the second problem? The second problem is, if you recall, our predicted value over here or the y is only binary number. Either it's zero for fail or one for pass. But what will happen if we do the prediction using a straight line? If we do the prediction using a straight line, it can go further in negative less than zero also. It can go higher than one. In fact, it can go all the way to plus infinity and all the way down to minus infinity. Now, in, in our predictions, a minus infinity, plus infinity, or anything which is more than zero, less than zero or more than one doesn't make any sense, right? Because anything, if you think there is a prediction which is coming or there is a Y prediction which is coming, which is minus five. Now, does minus five make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. So this is the second problem with linear regression. Now, how can we solve this? Here comes the beauty of logistic regression. Now, the point is this line is, is, is a, in a way it's good and it's predicting the value. The only problem with this is that this is extending beyond zero and above one also. So is there a way we can squish this line, we can transform this line in so that it can fit our data points, which are these circles, the small circles, in a better way? Can we squish, can we transform this line in some way? That's the crux of logistic regression. Suppose if we transform this line using some function and we made this line look like this, okay? In this particular case, what will happen? If we squish the line, a straight line, into a S-shape line like this, let's try to understand. In this particular case, what will happen? Again, the same logic. Anything where it is less than 0.5, I'll predict at a zero fail. Anything which is above 0.5, I'll predict it as a pass. If I do that, you can see my blue dotted line and everything on the right side over here are predicted correctly. Everything on the left hand side is predicted correctly as fail, right? So looks like if we transform the line, if we squish the line in a S shape figure, it will do the trick. Now there are two advantages of doing this squishing, right? One is this whole curve is squished between zero and one. So our problem, what we are seeing with like extended beyond one and going in the negative direction below zero has gone away with this. Okay, and the second advantage we are getting, it's a, it's a better prediction. So as you can see, we are able to predict clearly or correctly. Now this particular S-shape function is called logistic function or a sigmoid function. You may have heard these terms, logistic or sigmoid. This is what it is. Let's try to understand this function clearly. So this function, suppose we have a x variable or for that matter, call it z on a x axis. Then the function, the S shape function looks like this. It looks like a S shape. And how this function is defined? It is defined as one by one plus e to the power minus z. Now z is my x variable. So you can call it x or z or whatever. It is that x. So it, this z is getting transformed on the y axis using this formula. This is what it is, right? This is the transformation which we are trying to do. Now, what is this E? This E is Euler's number, okay? And it is used in, in various mathematical scenarios and for natural log also, the base is E, right? Okay, now, why this particular, why only this particular function is doing the trick? Let's try to understand that also intuitively, okay? Let's say when z value is zero, what will happen? If the z is zero, then e to the power zero, e to the power zero, anything to the power zero becomes one. One plus one, the denominator becomes two. And one by two is 0 0.5. So one thing is very clear, friend, that at zero, at x is equal or z is equal to zero, my y, or zz will be 0 0.5. So it's very symmetrical across the y-axis, okay? Now, if my z is going to negative infinity, 
z is negative infinity if re replace z with negative infinity negative infinity multiplied by minus sign will become positive infinity e to the power positive infinity since e is a number greater than 1 e to the power positive infinity will become a very 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 large number and now you know that 1 divided by very large number is actually very close to 0 right so if my z is going if my z is going in the negative infinity direction my gz or my y axis will touch 0 right on the other side if my z is going on a positive direction over here in the top right side if you see if it is going very far in the positive direction e to the power minus positive infinity will become a very 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 small number right this e to the power minus infinity will become a very small number since e is a number greater than 1 this becomes very small number or close to 0 so 1 by 1 plus some number which is close to 0 will actually become 1, right? Or will tend to become 1, will be very, very close to become 1. So when z approaches positive infinity, my gz will approach 1. So if you recall this particular table over here, then you can see and appreciate that why a logistic or sigmoid function is squishing the line in this fashion, right? So again to recall at 0 it is approaching 0 0.5 my y will be 0 0.5 so it's very symmetric to y axis when my z goes on the negative infinity direction it becomes 0 when my z goes on positive infinity direction it becomes 1 so my whole line or this the range of this function is between 0 and 1 what is what usually is squished between 0 and 1 probability if you know probability then you know that the probability of something happening is zero and something not happening is zero and probability of on the other side of the spectrum it, it is it is certain of something which is very very certain right hundred percent then the probability is one right if something the chances of that happening is nil or negligible the probability is zero so in a way this gz or what we are trying to predict is predicting the probability of something happening right We'll just see. Try to understand what we have done till now and recap. So we had a line and we are trying to fit a best fit line using linear regression. But the problem we noticed was that, okay, my x should be between 0 and 1, but it is going far away from 1 on the positive infinity side and it is going below on the negative direction in two, towards negative infinity also. So that was not working out, right? What we did is, we applied sigmoid or logistic function on my y axis and I squished my line into a S shape function and which is which is bounded between 0 and 1. That's what we did, right? And what we used? We used logistic function which is gz 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus z. Now friends, if you recall from your elementary school mathematics, then the equation of a straight line is mx plus c where c is the intercept, m is our slope. So the straight line equation or the equation of this line is mx plus c, right? The m is the slope, c is the intercept. Clear? Now when we squish this line over here in this SF function over here, my what I am trying to do is if my z or y whatever you want to call it mx plus c, if I replace this with this, this becomes my new y. This becomes my new y axis over here, right? Or gz. So my new y axis is a transformation done on mx plus c or a transformation done on this straight line and that's why this straight line is getting squished into this sf function this is the basic this is the basis or the crux of the logistic regression or the logistic function or the sigmoid function let's try to move on okay now let's try to understand this that why that sigmoid function came? What is the origin of that? Why only that function? Are there any other function which could have done the trick? Let's try to understand that. And here I will need your little bit of knowledge of probability also. So what are odds? And when we always say that what are the odds that you will win? What are the odds that India will win this match? When we say odds, what we are referring is the chance of winning by the chance of losing. Let's say the chance of winning is P. 
and p my friends will be between 0 and 1 let's say in the case that india winning the match we say the odds are 3 3 is to 1 what do we actually mean we mean that this ratio of odd that india winning the probability of india winning divided by the probability of india not winning is equal to 3 right so there is three chance of india winning versus one chance of india not winning which is the probability is 0.75 right so 0.75 probability will be represented in the form of odds as 3 is to 1 right three chance of winning one chance of losing okay so friends i hope this odds is clear right p by 1 minus p if the p is the chance of getting something done happening something then obviously 1 minus p is of that event not happening right it's the it's the opposite of that and the odds is p by 1 minus p if we take the log of that the log of odds or log odds if we take an a natural log then on the left side it will become log odds on the right side it will be log of natural log of we call it ln natural log p by 1 minus p right now if you recall what is this probability this probability over here is my y axis which is same as my sigmoid function 1 plus e to the power minus z right because we did this transformation to squish the line between 0 and 1 right so my probability which is the y axis is nothing but 1 plus e to the power minus z where z was what as we seen in the last slide mx plus c best fit line right now if we do little rearrangement of this particular thing right then we'll see that my z actually if we solve it for z and the way to solve that is for z is that you rearrange in such a way that e to the power minus z will 1 plus e to the power minus z will be 1 by p and then e to the power minus z then to a natural log both the sides if you do this rearrangement simple algebra you land up in if you solve for z then z is equal to natural log of p by 1 minus p okay now p by 1 minus p as we have already seen is called log odds okay now that's why we call it sometime that's why the name logistic or logic or log odds came so if somebody asks you tomorrow in the interview that hey why logistic function is called logistic function or log odds this is the reason why it is called log odds because actually on the y-axis what we are what we are representing is not z but the log odds of it okay and we are doing and what we are doing we are doing the regression on log odds we are still trying to find the m and the c variable right the the slope and the intercept just like how we do for a linear regression what we are doing we are doing it on a transformed y-axis and that's my friend why the name is stuck is as logistic regression although it is a classification algorithm you understand why we are doing what we are doing over here is we are performing a regression on log odds okay and that's why it is called logistic regression we are performing a regression on the logistic function that's why it's called logistic regression and the name is stuck why we are why it is categorized as a classification because we are predicting a binary probability over here between 0 and 1 that's why it's a classification a binary classification algorithm we can predict two classes 0 or 1 happening not happening tumor non tumor right tumor or benign pass or fail spam or no spam we always do binary classification but what we are internally doing we are doing a regression analysis on the log odds that's why we call it logistic regression so we have answered our second question also over here now let's try to dig deeper into the maths okay now for every uh, in case of that is the intuition of the logistic regression and why it is called a regression but for any algorithm one thing friends you would be knowing that we always have to minimize that function right there has to be a loss or cost function associated with it so for optimizing or finding the true parameter or the optimized parameter of that model we have to have a loss function and that loss function we can use various techniques like gradient descent and uh, other optimization techniques and we can arrive at the optimum model parameters value so in case of 
linear regression also if you have watched my previous video on gradient descent you would know that in linear regression what is that mx plus c is written in just a different form theta 0 and theta 1 theta 0 is you can consider as an intercept or c theta 1 you can consider it as a slope with respect to my x1 variable okay i'm taking a very simple example of one variable okay one feature this is my y or the hypothesis function now we can represent this into a different form which is theta tx this is just the vectorized form of it okay now what will in case of linear regression what will be my cost or loss function my cost of loss function is the mean square error right mean square error what is mean the mean is over here i'm squaring this and taking the because since they were <coughs> 1 by 2, I am just putting it over here. So when I take the differential, this 2 should cancel out. But what I am doing? My mean square error. I am squaring the errors. What is the error? Error is the difference between your predicted minus observed variable. This is predicted. This is observed. And I am squaring this. This is simple like what we do in a linear regression case. Now, RMS or the root mean square error or MSC, sorry, MSC, mean square error. Does it make much sense in case of logistic regression? If I do the same kind of loss function for a logistic regression, it will not make sense. Can you guess why it will not make sense? Over here in logistic, uh, in linear regression, these are continuous variables. So we can actually, if you remember, we can, we, h theta xi minus yi is nothing but the but the distance between predicted and the best fit line, the observed and the best fit line, right? That is the distance. In, in a case of logistic regression, we are dealing with continuous, not continuous, but categorical data. So my h theta xi and yi will either be one or zeros. That's it, right? It, it is not a continuous, it will not be a continuous function. So will it make sense? No, it will not make sense because it will either be zero or one. That's all we are going to get. We are not going to get a continuous data over here. So for logistic regression, my mean square error doesn't make sense. So what should be our loss for categorical data or in case of logistic regression setting? Let's try to see. Now, this thing is very simple. What it is trying to tell you is if y is equal to 1, if my observed y is equal to 1, then h theta x, the, my hypothesis function will become h theta x or the p probability or the predicted probability. Okay. If my y is equal to 0, it should be the 1 minus of that, right? I hope it is clear, right? It's very simple and intuitive in that way, right? If my observed data point is one, if, if a student has passed, if a student has passed, then I want the probability of that should be h theta x, right? My hypothesis function. If a student has failed, then my probability of that, of him failing is one minus the pass, pass right? Suppose, take it with an example. Let's say the hypothesis function or the prediction is 0.7, okay? The, now this 0.7 represents that there is a 70% chance of that per, that this guy has passed the exam, right? That's what it means. So y is equal to 1, the probability of y is equal to 1 given x and theta is 0.7, right? What will be the probability of y is equal to 0 given x and theta? 1 minus 0.7, which is over here, 0.3, right? Now. Can we represent these two lines in a in a more succinct or a, or a simpler way? Yes, we can. Let's try to see that if it makes only that sense or not. Let's say if y is equal to, okay, let's say if y is equal to 1, then this value will be 1, it will be h theta x, correct? This value will 1 minus y, 1 minus 1, which will become 0, the exponentiation, this will become 0. Anything, any base raised to the power 0 is 1. So this whole term will become 1, right? And this term is h theta x, correct? So in case of y is equal to 1, we are getting h theta x. Let's see if the y, because it's a binary classification problem, the observed value can only be y0 or y1, right? Let's say the situation where y is 0. 
in that case this will be 0 that means this whole term become 1 because anything raised to the power 0 is 1 the left side this will become 1 what will happen to this y is 0 that means this whole exponentiation is 1 1 minus h theta x so again y is 0 then it becomes 1 minus h theta x so this particular thing or these two equations are combined together and written can be written in this way okay now why we are writing it in this way we'll see now suppose we have m training examples that means we have n observations or rows in our training data what will happen recall little bit of probability over here let's say the probability of tomorrow being a rainy day is 1 by 2 and the probability of me going to watch a movie is 1 by 3 okay the probability of having rain tomorrow is 1 by 2 the probability of me watching a movie tomorrow is 1 by 3 what is the probability that tomorrow it will rain and I will go to watch a movie what do you do in that case if you recall we multiply these two probabilities right over here also we have to multiply these individual probabilities of across all observations right and this big sigma notations you shouldn't be afraid of that all it is saying is that all these observations from i is equal to 1 to m they are getting multiplied over here right so all the this was for one instance or one observation now I'm generalizing it from y i is equal to 1 to m and I'm multiplying it okay so when I multiplied this h theta x psi y i and now this sub superscript i is representing the one observation right so I'm multiplying it okay now this big notations is saying that all the individual element terms are multiplied okay now when they are multiplied we have to take a natural log of this now why we are taking a natural log of this particular thing now we do not want to deal with this multiplication things okay multiplication thing is very complex to evaluate it has um, uh, the mathematicians were not very great in evaluating they thought that okay we have we should take a natural log of this by taking a natural log all the exponentiations will go away if you if you see so and there are two two actually benefits if you take the log of this then your multiplication becomes additions right so log a b is log a plus log b this is the common formula right of log log a into b is same as log a plus log b so this multiplication will become addition that's one thing and log retains the shape of the function so whatever function this was and whatever shape it had even if i take a natural log of this it will retain that same shape by retaining the same shape means that the maxima or minima because we are doing an optimization problem over here will remain the same and that's why when we take the natural log of that what will happen this exponentiation will come in the front so y i log h x i plus again this exponentiation will come in front and this log will log actually does the addition right instead of multiplication so that's why we are saying a summation term rather than a big sigma notation over here so 1 minus yi into log 1 minus hxi so friend how we are coming from this equation to this equation is clear we are not doing anything we are taking a natural log of it right and then we are simplifying it this is called maximum log likelihood so in case you have been hearing this term that <clears throat> what is maximum like log likelihood this is maximum log likelihood okay we are combining the probability of all these observations happening right that's what the log likelihood and this my friend is our objective function or our cost function this is what we will try to maximize or minimize depending on the depending on the scenario right okay but we have not yet reached to our loss function so this was our objective function i know that we have taken the natural log of our initial maximum log maximum likelihood function since we are minimizing our goal is over here is to minimize our loss function what we'll do we'll put a negative sign in front of it now you'll ask me that hey why we are putting a negative sign in front of it 
now the reason why we are putting a negative sign in front of it if you recall over here this particular function this is going to give the maximum likelihood right maximum log likelihood of and that's why it is objective function but in 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 machine learning we always minimize we try to see the in, in a convex function, we try to see the bit of it or the bottom of it. We always try to minimize. When we have to minimize it, we should put a negative sign in front of it, right? So that this function becomes, rather than a concave, it becomes a convex function, upward down, and we should try to arrive at the bottom of it. This, my friend, is called the binary cross entropy loss or the logistic loss. So many a time you will hear people saying that hey, this is the logistic loss or the binary cross entropy loss. This is nothing but this particular function, the negative of your log of maximum likelihood function, right, or objective function, okay. Now we have got our loss function, okay. What we should do logically next, that we have to run it through an optimization algorithm, okay, to arrive at the minima. This particular function at this point, you have to trust me that this is a convex optimization problem, that this particular function is a convex function. And in any convex function, what we can do, a true convex function, we can apply our gradient descent algorithm, right? And it, it will try to go and arrive at the global minima. Okay, if you have not watched my uh, video on gradient descent, I highly, highly recommend you to go and watch it out over there. Okay. Let's apply gradient descent on this loss function. Now, how do we apply gradient descent? What we do is we calculate the gradient. We have a learning rate alpha. We have a learning rate alpha over here. We try to calculate the gradients. Now, this will look very clumsy and like math type, but it's actually very simple if you see, okay? All you need to do is to see this formula, okay? And the loss of it. And what we are trying to do, we are trying to get the partial derivative of this with respect to our parameter theta, okay? So this is a generalized form with respect to theta j, one of the parameter, I'm doing a partial derivative of this, okay? So if you recall partial derivative and, and the way partial derivatives are calculated, over here, this y i term, since this is observed, uh, this is observed behavior. This is a constant for it. All my thetas or the variables are part of HSI, right? When I'm doing this particular thing, and HSI and G theta x are the same thing. Theta x is, we are represented in a vectorized form, right? If you are taking a log, you recall that log of x is one by x, right? And then you take the partial derivative of x with respect to whatever, uh, theta you are taking it. So in this particular case, it will become since y is a constant, it will come as it is 1 by g theta x over here minus again 1 minus y over here and this and then outside because this g theta x is still there and we are this del sign, this is called this d and it is it is called as del. So del is nothing but it's a derivative. If you know derivative, this is similar to derivative. Only thing difference is this is called partial derivative with respect to d theta. If we have multiple variables, then we have to take the partial derivative with respect to one variable, right? In this particular case, we are taking the partial derivative with respect to theta j, okay? We are taking it. Now after do little bit of juggling, what we have arriving at is this particular formula. So del theta j, del loss theta by del theta j is nothing but your y minus h theta x xj, okay? Now xj is the jth, what is that? This is the jth feature, right? And the theta j is my jth parameter value, okay? Now, if you recall, and if you have watched my uh, gradient descent video with linear regression, this will look very, very similar to you. This is exactly same in case of linear regression also. Only thing is different is h theta x over here is my logistic function now applied onto y mx plus c. Over there, my h theta x is actually mx plus c, right? So that is the only difference between, uh, between this, this, this partial derivative when we are doing it for linear regression or doing it for logistic regression. Now, this is the standard form how we do gradient descent. What it actually means is that 
theta j and it's a iterative optimization algorithm this is my del theta j right this is my del theta j over here what i'm trying to do i'm trying to iteratively with a learning rate alpha over here okay with the learning at alpha over there i'll take a small small steps towards the bottom of the pit that's what i'm doing if we have only one variable so this will be theta 1 it will it is very simple this x1 will be over there and what will be the theta 0 or the interceptor for intercept term there is no xi xi or x0 is 1 over here so this whole term will go away this will just be 1 it will be theta j plus my learning rate yi minus h theta xi right that that's what it is okay again i'm repeating over here that h theta x is nothing but your uh, theta t theta transpose x in a vectorized form run over the sigmoid function which is 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus theta transpose x where my sigmoid function is represented as 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus z so this is how we run gradient descent on logistic loss okay and this is this is in the next session i think this video is becoming too long i'll take a pause over here when i come back in the subsequent in the part two of this video series what i'm going to do is i will code this from scratch and i will also try to answer that why logistic regression is considered as a simple form of neural network okay so we'll try to answer those two questions in the next video if you like this video um, i have a favor to ask you please go ahead and subscribe, share, comment. That will mean a lot to me. Uh, thank you. With that being said, I'll, I'll, I'll take a leave. Bye.